Yeah, welcome back to Think Tank. This is Hawaii, the state of clean energy, our flagship energy show every Wednesday at 4 p.m. I'm Jay Fidel, uh, and we're talking today with Richard Ha, who's uh, what do I call an, an energy environmentalist on a big island, and for many years uh, he had this wonderful farm. Was it Hamakua Farm? Hamakua Farms in uh, Hamakua, Richard, wasn't it? it, it it's uh, Hamakua Springs. Right, I remember. Yeah. yeah. Now you're not doing the farm anymore, but you're certainly doing energy. Tell us about it. Yeah, so, well, you know, I, I went uh, back 10 years ago. I, I went over to uh, explore and learn about energy because my costs were going up, you know, about 2008 when the uh, uh, oil price spiked. Uh -huh. so, so I went over there to one of five association for the study of peak oil, and it was in Houston. And the first thing, I picked up, but there was about maybe 500 of us there. Um, the first thing I noticed was um, they said the world had been using twice as much oil as it had been finding and had been doing that for the last 20 years. And right there, you know, as a banana farmer, I knew that this, you know, it's a finite research. It, it, it's it's uh, something we've got to pay attention to. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I... You know, I just got off the phone with uh, Lou Pugliarisi, who is a, uh, a think tank um, person with uh, E-Prink in Washington, and he was in China and Japan looking at their energy supply. And one of the elements that came through is that the U.S. is, under Trump, is exporting um, substantial qualities of uh, gas, including LNG, and for that matter, mm -hmm. oil. We, we were having what he called an energy... And energy, and that's mostly fossil fuel, a renaissance right now. And so if right. you thought that people were listening to Greta Thunberg, if you thought that people were concerned about climate change, uh, you got to moderate your thinking. Um, in fact, we're generating more uh, gas and oil than we were a few years ago, and we're selling more of it to the world. Um, and that's likely to continue. So here in Hawaii, nay, uh, you know, we're focused on clean energy, but um, you know, we're, we're probably ahead in, in terms of percentages uh, of most other states and, uh, and the national averages anyway. And so, uh, uh -huh. to me, it's very important that we keep on doing that, although I think we have to recognize that the world right now under this administration is not as concerned about it as we are. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and the second thing I learned when I was there was this concept called energy return on investment. Mm -hmm. And there's this uh, Professor Charlie Hall, who's the father of uh, EROI. Mm -hmm. And basically what it says is it takes energy to get energy. And the net energy that results is what society gets to use. So, you know, several examples. Back in the 1930s, the energy, one barrel of oil would get you 100. Um, today, it's down to around 20 to 1. Shale oil and the tar sands is like six to one. Um, so it, it's, it's getting harder and harder. The net return is less and less. And the more you go, uh, the more energy it takes to go find it. When you get to one to one, there's no point in, in going anymore because there's no benefit, yeah. energy benefit to yeah. it. Yeah, that doesn't mean there's no oil. That means there's a lot of oil. It's just not worth going after. Well, and arguably, arguably, uh, people in the industry, the engineers and scientists and the like who work in and for the industry are finding new uh, technologies uh, that will m improve that ratio and will make it cheaper to, uh, to get this fuel out of the ground. Um, but yeah. certainly, I mean, we, we knew a long time ago that um, sh shale requires a lot of energy squeeze the mm -hmm. shale and, and, and sort of crack the shale physically into uh, oil. We know that the oil is in the shale, but getting it out is expensive. And the same thing with the tar sands. The tar sands, uh, yeah. it's, it, tar is mixed with sand, um, and uh, it's, uh, it, the tar is oil, but you have to mm -hmm. process it to get, out, get it out. And what all that tells me is that uh, there's not as much um, you know, liquid oil fuel available and that we have to use these new techniques and we have to use this technology and it's going to get more expensive as we go forward. Um, it's very troublesome. Yeah. We need to focus yeah. on uh, other kinds of energy, especially 
clean energy given the crisis of climate change. I say crisis yep. because I think that cl climate change is the, the biggest story in the news every day. And yep. we all have to be very mindful because our, uh, the, our lives and fortunes are going to depend on how we handle climate change, the whole world. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and uh, in 2009, you know, that's when shale just started and, and I was going to these big oil conferences and we realized it just started. Nobody really knew what the potential was, but I was sitting in, a, in, in a, a Denver at the next uh, uh, big oil conference and uh, in this panel discussion, Art Berman said that they studied 4,000 shale wells in the Barnett shale because the Barnett was the new one at that time. And that's 4,000 wells. He said the average well produced 96, uh, no, I'm sorry, 90% of what he was going to produce in, all within four years. And I'm sitting in the back of the room thinking, holy smokes, does that mean that every four years we have to drill another well just to stay even? And in 2009, the answer was yes. But since 2009 to now, they found many diff different shale uh, plays. A, a total of about 10. Most of them are, are stable and in decline. Mm. And the Barnett Shale, which was starting its production at that time, is now in permanent decline 10 years later. So I already knew it in 2009. But now it's, it's getting to the point that um, the Permian Basin, which is the largest uh, supplier of, of, of shale oil for the U.S. But where is that? That's in, in Texas, mm -hmm. Permian. Yeah, so they, um, what they found is that the shale wells, what, what people do is they go and drill the sweet spots, wherever they think is the best place so that they can get the, uh, most, get the most money for their efforts. So they did that in the Permian. But now 50% of the wells in the Permian are wells that they drilled in between. So the mother wells, they, they set it up and they, they did pretty well. And now they're going to what they call the child wells. But the problem with child wells is it uh, cannibalizes from, from others. So, so the productivity of it is, is less. Now, you mentioned uh, uh, technology. And of course, you know, in the last three, four years, technology has, has increased at the, the, the production mm -hmm. and lowered the cost but did not increase the amount of uh, uh, a shale well down there. So mm -hmm. what they did was instead of four years, now it comes out in three years. So what we're doing is more rapidly uh, uh, depleting the resource. That, that's what's going on now. You know, I remember when, when these issues first, you know, flowed into public discussion, uh, one of the big, you know, points of discussion was uh, how, how much oil is left? Um, and, and that seemed to go away when, you know, we were told that, oh no, the, the technology can provide, um, you know, more oil, um, mm -hmm. you know, than, than before. Um, and then, of course, it also flowed out of discussion when uh, we were told that uh, there, there's, there's a, an, effectively an unlimited supply of natural gas down there, including LNG. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think I think the issue still exists, doesn't it? That you know that at some point along the way we're going to run out. We're going to run out of both. Isn't that true, Richard? It is because you know the shale, uh, gas, and oil are related to each other. They have the same characteristics. It won't last forever. The shale gas now, of course, there's a lot. They 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 flare it and and they give it away practically if they could. But that's not going to last forever. Once they they are able to export it and 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 start selling it, you know, it'll, it'll decline as well. Mm -hmm. Well, and the, the trick is the, going to go up. The trick is to get to uh, alternative fuels uh, for, you know, many reasons, but especially climate change and the, the effect of fossil fuel, um, but other reasons too. And, and we have to move that way. Unfortunately, uh, as uh, Greta Thunberg has made all too clear, um, is that, is that people are not, countries and governments are really not addressing this problem. They're rather going the other way in, in a lot of cases. And, and for the lack of leadership by this administration, 
in Washington right now. Uh, other countries um, are not as excited, perhaps, as they, as they were when COP21 and, and climate change issues were at the top of the agenda. So, you know, Hawaii should be, is, can be uh, a leader in addressing fossil fuels. And, and when uh, we talked, you and me, uh, a day or two ago, you were talking about the great game changer. Uh, and I think that's very interesting, not only for Hawaii, where it would happen, um, but for any place watching Hawaii, any place affected by what we do here as leaders in renewable energy. Can you talk about the great game changer, Richard? Yeah, but, you know, first I'd like to comment about uh, HELCO and HECO and what they've done. They've mm -hmm. done a really good job because they've been leading the, the whole country, actually, in in. Uh, uh, fossil fuel renewables and 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 uh, uh, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but having said that, we we have on the Big Island geothermal, and not only in 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 the East Rift, but under uh, in the around the base of Mauna Kea, a, a lot of heat. So so the way the geothermal company and Helco works together is that out of the 38 megawatts geothermal provides now, half goes to guarantee that they'll use it and they'll pay for it. The other half is standby. So in other words, if something bad happens, then they get to switch through the switch and they expect to get the electricity almost instantaneously. Mm -hmm. Now, the game changer is this. Instead of throwing the switch off when it's not needed and just waiting a standby, throw the switch on and 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 generate um, hydrogen as a byproduct. So now, when you think about it, they're making money off the off the main uh, uh, product, which, which which is the half that they supply and which which the the utility needs as a base power. But they have all this uh, other. Uh, capacity that they're not using. They're just waiting to be asked to use it. So instead of uh, just waiting, convert it to hydrogen. It doesn't cost anything. It's a byproduct. So so it has really strong implications because the U.S. mainland, uh, there's a difference between us and the U.S. mainland. We decided to stay with uh, fossil fuel which and heavy oil, which, we, which we're using now. The rest of the country went to natural gas and coal and stuff, but primarily natural gas. Natural gas is pretty cheap right now. So everybody is concerned about the carbon that comes out of it and climate change, as you, as you, you're pointing out. So the way, there's two ways to get hydrogen. One, one is to take apart the natural gas. But when you do that, you have the added cost. First, you gotta pay for it. And second of all, when you take it apart, you gotta deal with the carbon. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, so you build up your costs. On the other hand, you come to Hawaii and hydrogen is a byproduct. It's just an afterthought. It's, it's like practically free. And that is a game changer because Hawaii has never been in front um, of the energy situation like it could be in this particular instance. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, what are the, the other byproducts, Richard, so I know? Uh, so the hydrogen is a byproduct of what, geothermal? Uh, what are the yeah. other byproducts? From geothermal? Yeah. Uh, for, well, basically, it's just the, the fact that they're not using the electricity. They're just waiting on standby. I see, I see, I see. And, and then that's a battery, too. The hydrogen serves right. as a battery. It's dispatchable anytime you want. Absolutely. Yeah. And you can transport it, you know, and it's a little bit more complicated. But it's 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 uh, it's been done. You know, different parts of the world they do different uh, ways of uh, handling hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So it, it has been done already. So it's not it's not a, a something that uh, is is brand new. Well, let me I mean, let me it, technically it's brand new, but you know. Let me let me yeah. raise uh, two questions. Uh, you know about th this um, you know this model of uh, using geothermal uh, to create hydrogen and then. Um, and then using the hydrogen wherever and whenever you like. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, all, it all rings true to me. I've been following hydrogen 
uh, for a long time, and I've been following geothermal for a long time. And I, I know that HNEI, White Natural Energy Institute, and um, Rick Rochelot and um, Mitch uh, Ewan have been working on this for a long time. And, and, so, and yeah. so is Stan Osterman, the hydrogen coordinator for the state. But, um, right. you know, I get two, two issues that I, I'd like to mention to you. The first issue is um, geothermal ran into what I'm going to call it cultural problems, which turned out to be political and legal problems back in the 90s. And essentially, yeah. uh, you know, the protesters there, mostly Native Hawaiians, uh, who felt that, uh, you know, taking uh, geothermal out of the, the ground was to penetrate Haley's breast in the Big Island, and that was offensive to mm -hmm. them. And so mm -hmm. they, they, they fought back. They protested, and there were, there were incidents of violence. There were incidents of threats, death threats, um, to the mm -hmm. scientists and the engineers involved. It was all terribly unpleasant. It, it ultimately mm -hmm. set, settled down in the late 90s, um, mm -hmm. and uh, ORMAT came in and became the operator of the geothermal uh, facility there in Pune, a Pune Geothermal mm -hmm. f Venture. Uh, and it's been generating, you know, uh, at, a, at a limited rate, I would say, uh, since then and until the eruption a couple a year ago. So um, mm -hmm. the, the, problem, the problem with all of that is um, the resistance hasn't gone away uh, and that politically there's been a kind of cap on the amount of geothermal that P PGV has been able to take out of it. I want to say it's uh, something around 38... Um, megawatts, maybe 40, but um, mm -hmm. it could, the, these wells could provide much more than that, and they've been limited as a practical matter because of the, you know, the political limitations, political pushback. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't think that pushback has ended. I think um, that if you wanted to expand the uh, production, if you wanted to even resume the production, and there's an issue there because, you know, as, as we know, you can you can make a, a protest that will stop a project. And right now, I, I think there's probably people who would like to stop this project on the same basis they wanted to stop it in the 90s. Um, so we have, we have a sort of built-in political cultural limitation about PGV, which is the biggest source of geothermal in the state right now. I know there are other possibilities, but the one that's working and has proven out is uh, PGV. So what do you say to that, Richard? How do we get by that problem? Well, you know, I've been uh, uh, involved in that, and I'm trying as much as possible to educate about that because I'm directly involved with the 30-meter telescope. I'm one of the people that are pro 30-meter uh, uh, telescope. Mm -hmm. So during the discussion, and, and the discussion that I like to have is a courteous one, not not us against you kind of a thing, mm -hmm. the more a discussion about the facts, yeah? Mm -hmm. So so every chance I get when we're talking about the 30-meter telescope, I bring up geothermal, and I talk about the characteristics and why it's safe. Uh, and, and things have changed, you know. I, I, can, I can feel it. It has it, changed quite a bit. And, and here's why, because the focus that was there many years ago is, it might be focused more on Mauna Kea. And then that's one thing. And the second thing is there was an eruption that happened, a Kapoho eruption just recently. And um, the folks that were involved directly, especially Ikaika Marzo, knows exactly how the, the rift stone works because he was walking the ground. He knew where, where the lava was coming, where the rift stone was going, all the way out to, to the ocean. So he knows all that. He, can, he saw all, all of that. And, and he knows that, that the... Uh, the geologists and the science and the people from the Hawaii Volcano Observatory, um, you know, when they, they do the reports, because they track all the earthquakes and everything like that, it's, it's, it's not going to fall off the side of the earth. You know, it's, it, we're, it's such a tiny project relative to, to what uh, 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 geothermal represents. Mm -hmm. And if you saw a picture from the air, mm -hmm. what you would see is the geothermal, except for several two, three wells, is intact. The whole area around there, several hundred houses disappeared. Mm -hmm. so, so, and why is that? It's because they set up the location of the, that, the PGD site 
from the geothermal site on the high ground. So, so when the when it erupted, it went all around because it was lower, mm -hmm. and PGV is on the higher ground. So, and and the reason it's on the Hilo side is because they deliberately they know where the East Rift Zone was, and they set it up deliberately to be on the Hilo side where the transmission lines were. Mm -hmm. So, so if you just went to the uh, uh, Hawaii Volcano uh, 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 Observatory, talk to the scientists, they would be able to explain uh, uh, the characteristics and the safety of it. Uh, Richard, why don't we, why don't we take a, a short break, uh, then we'll come back in one minute and continue this conversation. Aloha, my name is Wendy Lowe, and I want you to join me as we take our health back. On my show, all we do is talk about things in everyday life, in Hawaii or abroad. I have guests on board that will just talk about different aspects of health in every, in every way, whether it's medical health, nutritional health, diabetic health, you name it, we'll talk about it. Even financial health, we'll even have some of the Miss Hawaii's on board and all the different topics that I feel will make your health and your lifestyle a lot better. So come join me. I welcome you to take your health back. Mahalo. Aloha, I'm Stan Osterman, Stan the Energy Man, every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. If you're really interested in finding out what's going on in energy, especially here in Hawaii, but also all the way around the world, and especially if it has to do with hydrogen, look into Stan the Energy Man every Friday, 12 o'clock, Think Tech Hawaii. Be there. Aloha. Okay, we're back with Richard Ha, who joins us uh, my phone from the Big Island, um, and we're talking about, we're on the Hawaii uh, State of Clean Energy show uh, every Wednesday at 4 p.m., and, and we're talking about um, you know, the game changer, hydrogen on the Big Island, and maybe more. So, Richard, you were, you were telling me um, how we can get by uh, the political, cultural problem uh, that has existed around Puna Geothermal Venture over the past, mm, however many, 20 years or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and uh, we we had conversations with um, Bill Isla, yeah, the, uh, mm -hmm. the director of of DHHL, the mm -hmm. Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Mm -hmm. And on Department of Hawaiian Homelands, there's a uh, uh, geothermal. So so it, it just imagine part of the problem we have at uh, 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 the thirty meter telescope are Hawaiians that that are very upset because they're dying on the wait list for. The Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Mm -hmm. So, if we were able to uh, enable a geothermal operation there, it'll do several things. One is diversify the risk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you put it up there on Hawaiian Homeland. You know the, the 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 fact that the Department of Hawaiian Homeland owns the resource means they don't have to pay royalties. That royalties get up to about a million dollars a year just in saved royalties that would be an income stream not counting the income stream of actually doing a geothermal operation yeah that could really help them no that could be a a, a great a great contribution to an improvement in the quality of life absolutely and and can you imagine if they can go to hydrogen which they can of course for the same reason as a byproduct if they went to hydrogen and they started exporting it let's say you export it to oahu for example or export it wherever you, 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 because it can be exported. Mm -hmm. That in income stream would be pretty incredible because it would all be focused on Hawaiians. And you know, that's what we're talking about, yeah? Yeah. Uh, folks that don't get any benefit. Yeah. This is, this is a direct benefit from geothermal. Yeah. It, so, but one thing though is, uh, okay, let's assume that we have uh, geothermal wells working at Pune or uh -huh. elsewhere. Um, yeah. We have to have the uh, infrastructure to convert uh, and process, uh, I guess, the uh, geothermal into the hydrogen as a byproduct and so forth. Um, yeah. That's, that's going to cost a pretty penny, isn't it? How do you do that? Yeah, so, so if you were to use Elko's electricity to do it, it would be very expensive because it would be like 30-something cents a kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. Um, on the other hand, if you made it on site at the geothermal site, then it's a byproduct. Right. You can charge whatever you want. It could be hardly nothing. 
it, it depends on, on, of course, the, the deal that you can work, yeah? Mm -hmm. But we can, using uh, this as a byproduct, we can undersell any uh, a source of hydrogen coming from the U.S. because they have to buy the natural gas, then they have to transport it, then they have to uh, get rid of the carbon. So for the first time, we'll have an advantage over the whole U United States. You take the heat and you're generating electricity and Helco takes 20. And they tell you, you got to be able to provide 18 whenever they want it. Mm -hmm. So what they do is you just turn it off. What I'm saying is that don't turn it off. Keep it running and make okay. hydrogen out of it. I because see. it doesn't matter. Yeah, because the... We're going to be over the hotspot for 500,000 years. I see, I see. So you, you do go through the process of, of turning the geothermal into electricity, but that part which yeah. would be curtailed or that part which you don't use, you use that to yes. create the, uh, the hydrogen and you put that hydrogen in a bottle. Right, exactly. See, now all of a sudden, uh, uh, hydrogen from hydrolysis or from electricity going through water outcompetes picking apart natural gas mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. because it's a byproduct. Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's yeah. the game changer right there is the byproduct. So let me ask you, and, and you alluded to this earlier, and I, this is the other question I wanted to pose to you is transportation. You know, I, I've been to uh, HCAT, Stan Osterman showed me around, and he showed mm -hmm. me these uh, big um, tanks where you uh, put the hydrogen and you store it and you, and you transport it. Um, and it, it, in those tanks, uh, it, can, it can go really anywhere. Um, and mm -hmm. the question, question is, uh, how much uh, transportation infrastructure is in place, and how can we expand that to make the export of the hydrogen in the tanks um, a, a working model, you know, uh, uh, a successful export experience uh, to the mainland and to Asia, wherever, because, you know, mm -hmm. you, you have to have certain equipment and you have to have certain equipment at the re receiving end, take the hydrogen out of the tank and use it for whatever, you know, whatever activity you want to use it for. Uh, so where are we on that continuum? What do we have to do to build that infrastructure so that it becomes marketable and we can, you know, derive the benefits you were talking about? Yeah, so, so uh, Stan Osterberg and, and uh, Ms. Ewan folks, they know people who, who actually do it. And as a matter of fact, uh, 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 Japan is, is moving to the, toward the hydrogen economy if they can get there. And, and they've had two conferences now, so it's brand new. So there's a lot of things that's gonna be developing, but, but as I understand it, you could, you could ship it. It's more involved because the, the molecule is really small. Uh, uh, but, uh, but it can be done, mm -hmm. and and it's pretty much like propane. You just ship ship it that way, as how I understand it. Yeah. And you can ship more if you put it under pressure and and, and stuff like that. Yeah, so right. that's all technical stuff. Right. Well, you mentioned that uh, Paul Brubaker was uh, appearing what a couple of days from now in the uh, uh, Hawaii Economic Association to discuss this subject. So what do you know about that, and when where where does that fit in the in the picture of trying to develop hydrogen as an an export product? Yeah, so so they'll have it at the Holly Kalani, yeah, and oh. it's an all day affair. Ah, all day at the Holly Kalani. Okay, yeah. okay. It's, it's at the annual conference. Uh huh. And Paul has a breakout uh, a session, and and he'll be the moderator, asking the question, "What is the great game changer in the next ten years?" And I'm saying this is the great game changer. Now, now you mentioned Greta. Can can you imagine now? The geothermal is the greenest of all possible sources right here. Mm -hmm. Because instead of digging it out of the ground and, 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 and using diesel to, to run the machinery to, to, to get what you got to get out of the ground and heating it up and mixing it and making it into panels or whatever else you make it out of, and then and with, with fossil fuels and then shipping it to Hawaii or to the mainland with fossil fuels, you don't have to do any of that. All you got to do is get the heat from underground. There is no carbon involved at all. So on the front end, geothermal is absolutely clean. On the back end, there is no carbon. The only thing that comes out of your tailpipe is water. Yeah. So now we 
can be the leader for the whole nation and is an example, and somebody should tell Greta that. We should have her here, Richard. We should have absolutely. her on the show. You, me, and Greta. Um, yeah, absolutely. One, one thing that occurs to me from what you say, though, is very interesting, is that if we made batteries, um, sort of like that analogy that you made about uh, how many barrels of oil it takes to bring up a barrel of oil, um, if, if we make batteries, we have to spend a lot of energy and resources, um, you know, uh, uh, building the battery. And the, these yes. big batteries take an awful lot of energy and resources, and over time they decline, too, and you have to get another right. one. Um, and right. then, you have, then you have a disposal problem, uh, depending on what the battery yes. is made of, uh, what are you going to do with it when it's, when it's yeah. spent? So in the case yeah. of geothermal, none of those issues exist. You, you, you put it in the tank, it stays in the tank, um, it don't have any secondary effects to that. So as you said, it's a very good renewable, and it, it doesn't have any negative implications uh, as other renewables might have or batteries might have, yeah? Yeah, and, and, and take a look at this. You, you know the industrial scale geothermal uh, uh, um, that uh, Kauai has two? They only have four hours of battery storage, you know? Think about that. Yeah. Only four hours. Yeah. So, you, you really need about two, three weeks of battery storage to have a stable, dependable uh, source of electricity. But why don't they do more than four, four hours? Because it costs too much. That's right. So, so it will never replace oil. So what is our oil replacement? Because that's what we got to do, right? We have none. So if you had hydrogen, you could have as many of those tanks as you want, all stacked up, ready to go any time. And you could use yep. the ones you want to use and leave the other ones uh, for later. So the, the whole thing um, would allow for um, as, as much storage as you want over as many days as you want. We could have a storm that lasts a long time, and still there would be, there would be power. Um, so imagine, imagine what that would look like. So, so here's a, 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 a hydrogen fueling station. It's just like a, a, a regular gas station. You drive up, it takes you five minutes, you f it fills up your tank, and you're on your way. And yeah. all you got to do is bring the hydrogen to the place, put it in storage, and you have an electrolyzer that, that uh, 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 put, puts it in, in your, uh, uh, so you can put it in your car. So the economics is this. Which Ewan says that about uh, if, if the cost of the uh, hydrogen is equal to 10 cents a kilowatt hour at the, at, the, at the nozzle, it's equal to gasoline. So now try, try think about that. It's 10 cents. Can you get it from the source, which is a byproduct, to the gas station at 10 cents? Because if you can, you're economical now. If you can't, then you wait a little while until the... Uh, 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 the natural gas prices go up. Yeah, yeah. You know, so either way, you know, it, it's a finite resource. We're on the winning end of this deal. Well, Richard, we're out of time. That's Richard Haar from the Big Island, uh, a fellow who has followed energy, especially renewable energy, for many years. And we certainly always enjoyed talking with you, Richard. I look forward to the next time. Uh, oh, and I'm right. sure there'll be yeah. more to report. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Aloha. Okay.